You're listening to Drinks and a Movie with your host, Rudy. Spoiler alert. All right, cool. Drinks and a Movie podcast. People, thanks for uh, joining. I've got a special guest here, someone I've been trying to talk to for a while on the on the show. Uh, James Humphrey is here to talk about Mescal 33. James, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. And um, so this is um, a fairly new brand, right? Because I remember when I met you a couple years ago, you were talking about how you were just like working on getting it to the States, I think. Yes. Right, yeah. So, yeah. Well, it's new to the United States. Okay. So it's been in Mexico. They really launched the new bottling right when pandemic hit. Mm. So it, you know, it took its time in Mexico and then we brought it to the States in June of last year. Oh, so nice. yeah, so we're almost a year in. Yeah. yeah. I've been in this role now since March, uh, but the bottles got here you know, end of April, oh, sorry, end of May, beginning of June of last year. Hmm. How, how long was it, I guess, how long has it been around before it even got to the States? Like, so it started uh, in the middle, oh, gosh, I want to say it was 2014, 2015. Okay. The original uh, partner of my boss, Raul, who's the founder, they launched it in this, you know, short, square, squatty bottle, your typical mm. old school mezcal, you know, tequila bottle. And it did really well, but then they had kind of different visions of where they wanted to go. So they did an amicable split, split, and uh, Raul decided to kind of change the whole style of the bottle to really mimic what was the juice inside. Gotcha. You know, gotcha. they wanted to stand apart because the juice inside stands apart. So they redesigned the bottle to this very cool retro glass decanter. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. And how did um? I mean, so when I first met you, you were, I think, just coming out of High West. How did you get involved with, um, you know, Mescal 33? They found me. Okay. Yeah, they found me and we started talking and, you know, I've, I've, I've always loved the agave category. So for me, just to solely be able to focus on something, especially in Mescal, was really exciting because, you know, as there's so many Mescal here in the country, you know, it's agave is just in this huge surge. Yeah. Right. It's taking over whiskey. It's kicking vodka's butt. So for me, it was just, you know, I was willing to, OK, part every leave my comfort zone and move into something to try to build a brand in the United States. Nice, yeah. So I kind of was like, OK, challenge accepted. And yeah, it's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so. And I mean, I guess this is a, a frequently asked question, um, and I even get this a lot because I've just been dipping my toe more in Mescal recently. I'm definitely more of like a rye and bourbon person and trying to understand the differences and the nuances between tequila and Mescal. Can you give us like a breakdown on what, what are the differences? That, that's like the big question, right? Is tequila I always, and Mescal. Yeah. It's so funny because I'm, you know, even from way back when I first got in, when I first moved to California, I really... I didn't really know much about Mezcal. I had heard about it, mm -hmm. but I didn't understand it, right? Because on the East Coast, Mezcal wasn't really big. Tequila, mm -hmm. yes, Mezcal, really just hardcore agave lovers. So the way that it was taught to me was they're like, okay, tequila is cooked above ground okay. and Mezcal is cooked below ground, right? And then you have the difference of agave. Mm -hmm. But truly, it's really, there's, there's so many differences. Um, so there's not that many differences between the cooking methods. It's really, if you want to break it down very easily, tequila above ground, mezcal is cooked below ground. Okay. And then you have tequila is going to be Blue Weber, and then mezcal is every other agave. Okay. So okay. Yeah. I like that. That's a good simple. I, I can it's definitely easy. remember that. I mean, that. it's just, it's because <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm doing all these events and tastings and consumers yeah. just, they're like, oh, it's smoky tequila. Right, right. <laughs> no, not exactly. It's agave. And then they're like, wait, what? Agave? Yeah. <laughs> Our. Most mezcals, or at least mezcal 33, is it, I guess, because I know when it comes to tequila, there's numerous ways to make it. There's the very traditional kind of stone oven way. Then there's the, um, like the, is it called the autoclave, which is more efficient. And then there's like, I know there's like different yes. stages. Um, right. So with tequila, you have your Hornos, which is your, mm -hmm. you know, your brick oven. And then you have the autoclaves, which are the bigger, more industrial mm -hmm. size. And then you have, uh, with mezcal, it starts off with, okay, so with tequila, you have your Blue Weber, mm -hmm. right? You harvest the pinas and then you split them or you put them in a hole, you put them into the oven. Same idea with mezcal. So for instance, we use espadine. Espadine is the cultivated one, mm -hmm. right? It's the one that's the most commonly used because it only takes five to seven years to grow. Right. And then you put them into the earthen pits, right? They're the earthen pits, people call them barbacoas. And they're just lined with lava stone. And then they take whatever trees, whatever wood they can burn, 
unless they wanted to have a certain kind of essence of the smoke. Some people will put, um, gosh, they do all kinds of different woods in them to make it more like mesquite. You know, you ever okay, had that yeah. mezcal that's, you're like, well, this would go really good with a pulled pork sandwich, right, right. that kind of style. Um, and then they cover it with earth and then it basically bakes, it cooks within that earthen, and, and then it's taken out. So from that point, everything becomes kind of similar, really, you know, it depends on how you crush it. So you have the artisanal way, which is a Tahona, and then you could do ancestral, which is going to be like hand mash, mm -hmm. right? So there's a lot of, like, there's a lot of uh, mescaleros out there that just do tiny little batches. So they'll do what, 120 liters, they're in there with stone yeah, and they're right. and they're, you know, they're mashing it themselves or they're putting their, their cooked pinas out on a field and their cattle's just crushing it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which is interesting. <laughs> right. And I've had that mezcal before and I don't really want to talk about someone else's mezcal here. <laughs> um, it's fantastic. It's funky. It's mm -hmm. really does, you know, but there's, there's interesting things that the cattle let go of <laughs> that goes into the pinas <laughs> that helps right, with right. the fermentation. So if you're like, if you're making rum, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of similar. Okay. Um, with that funk. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, and then you have the way that you are distilling it and you have your copper pots or your mm -hmm. clay pots. So it's, it's very, it's the similarities. Um, you could definitely put them into that, you know, Mexican spirit category mm -hmm. because everything usually it started off as being it's tradition, yeah. right? It's passed down from generation to generation. You know, some of these mescaleros and, you know, master tequila makers, they're sixth generation, seventh right. generation, right? So um, a lot of them do the same practice just in a different way, mm -hmm. you know, do different agaves or they do, you know, they'll use wild yeast or they'll do, you know, uh, proprietary yeast. Like they found something that they like the flavor profile it gives, much like when you find with whiskeys, you know, gotcha. but most wow. of them will do that wild native yeast. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, it's so interesting to me, just the the methods and, I, I love the historical aspect of, about it with like families passing it down and, you know, someone's grandpa's out there doing the, doing the work, you know? It's yeah. Crazy. I mean, I've met some mescaleros in the last like 10 years that I've been into like really hardcore into the spirits industry mm -hmm. that, you know, their, you know, greatest, as far as they can go back, you know, seven grandfathers ago, Yeah, they were either making tequila, sotol mm -hmm. or mezcal, you know? So, I mean, if they say like Pancho Villa, he was, Drinking Satal, yeah. you know, like it goes all the way back to, you know, it's hundreds and hundreds of years. So yeah. and it's yeah. just, it really is something that's been around since, you know, calendars. Yeah. Speaking of. <laughs> <laughs> and these, um, so you brought two expressions here. Are these both um, Espadine or yes. different ages? Yep. And yep. No, they're, uh, okay. one is, so they're both Espadine. We have the Hoven. Mm -hmm. And what we do after that is we take that Hoven and then we put it into French oak barrels. And mm. we let it rest for three months, and that's how we get a reposado. Gotcha. And, and what makes it a hoven exactly? Hoven just means young. Okay. So think okay. of it in you know in agave terms, like with tequila, it's blanco, plata, mm -hmm. and then you have with mezcal, hoven. Okay. Yeah, cool. and I think that they had to kind of. I don't know the answer to this one, but it sounds like they more needed to kind of pull it apart mm -hmm. so it's not to be mistaken with a tequila. So they had to have something else. So it's hoven. But then you have tequilas that will say that they're hovens. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've definitely yeah. seen that. Yeah. yeah. Casanova. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like the old bottling, they had a Hoven come yeah. out and it was just young, but it wasn't aged to the three months for a repo. It was like mm. weeks. Okay. And it had like the yellow shoe to it. Yeah. So. <laughs> Damn, crazy. Yeah. You almost need an eye chart. <laughs> it's to figure it out. Like, yeah. can you draw me the graph? Yeah. yeah. So many categories and names and everything. It's crazy. <laughs> um, well, shall we you wanna dig into it a little bit? Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, because you haven't had this. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people, have, I've been doing a lot of different events. People have really been enjoying it. Thank you. And then I usually do a quick, I have lotion on my hands and hopefully <laughs> that won't go slipping out of my hands. So here. Thank you. So in Mexico, we really do love our mezcal, but we do it a little different. Mm -hmm. We pair with chocolates. Okay. So if you've ever done, have you ever done a mezcal tasting? With pairing um, with food before? Not pairing with food, no. Okay, so a lot of times they'll do it with cheese, fresh fruit, vegetables, fish, you know, all kinds of different things. Um, in Mexico, they found that they really wanted to do it with chocolates. Okay. So, for instance, we pair the hoven with an orange truffle, and we pair our reposado with a caramel truffle. And the reason we do the orange is because with the way that we make our mezcal, 
In traditional Moscow, you have a super, super heavy smoke, right? It's on the nose. It hits you right off the bat. Mm -hmm. It gets that all for the, you know, the olfactory senses, yeah. which is very off-putting to a lot of people unless they're really into spirits. They, right. Most of the time it's like, you know, the rye drinkers mm -hmm. or someone who likes spunky rums kind of stuff. So the way that we cook it, our mezcals is exactly the same, but it's all about what pinas we use out of that barcoa. So what we do is like those outer pinas that sit on the pit mm -hmm. and they get really, really cooked and they're the heaviest on the smoke, right? They're sitting on the old wood, they're sitting on the rock. We sacrifice those and we give them to someone else to do something else with a different project. We kind of, all, what we do is we only use the heart of the pit. So you're not punched with smoke. We wanted to, pull it down just a little bit yeah. because we wanted you to taste the actual agave right. and the sweetness of agave, right? And then you can also taste, you know, floral notes and then citrus notes, hence the orange truffle. So, mm -hmm. is that it? Oh, that's good. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely mezcal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just not, it's not an iodine you know, mm -hmm. that band-aid that a lot of people can associate with. Mm. So now take your chocolate. Hopefully they're not, oh, they're back together. I did an event and they were all melted. They're just kind of a <laughs> little bite. Enjoy that. And then you go back. And all of a sudden, the proof pops up in your palate, right? There's that black, that white pepper at the end, mm -hmm. and that kind of, not um, like that high spice. It starts hitting to the back of your throat. Yeah. It, but it really balances out really nicely. That's why it does so well in cocktails as well, because it's not overpowering. You can taste all the ingredients, mm -hmm. but you can taste the agave as well. Yeah, that's interesting. It To, to me, it almost kind of tastes like it mellowed a, a little bit in a way. Yeah, um, yeah wow. Like Here, do you want some more? <laughs> I don't think I. I'll, I'll I think I was. Moment. Yeah, I think I was scared that I was going to drop the bottle. <laughs> yeah. So we did a whole bunch of different market research before we landed on eighty proof. Mm. So, you know, some people really like those nineties and hundred proof, which I love. I absolutely Does love. Does that it. typically start to interrupt? Does that typically happen with mezcal? Like I, I thought, mezcal and tequila was typically. Like 80 was the standard. I know that some groups will do like still strength and stuff like that, but are there 100 proof? Yes. There's, I mean, you can oh. definitely come across. In Tapatio, hmm. for instance, their tequila, he has his what? I think it's 110 proof. I did not know that. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's got the silver <laughs> label on it. I want to say it's 110 proof. I should know that. Wow. That was a go to for a long time. But I mean, a lot of people, they really like to see something that's higher, especially, you know, the whiskey world changed the whole idea of what people thought would prove. Right. Nobody even cared. Nobody even knew, to be honest with you. I can't remember anybody that really cared about high proof spirits yeah. until the bourbon whiskey explosion mm -hmm. happened. And then from that point on, everyone wanted like, oh, we want, was it 90 proof, 92 proof, 95 proof, anything over 100? They really cared about that. So what they did was they, in market research, they did blind tests and they did it different proofs. Hmm. So it comes off the still at 114, which in all honesty, I wish that they would release something that was that and make it like a fire red bottle. Right. Because I bet you would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they found that the most flavor they could gut find, the most balance and everybody's love of it was right at 80. So that's why they released it at 80 proof. So, and it's, it can be considered lower, mm -hmm. but by all standards, but the industry standard for anything is 80. Right. 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 Anything lower than that, you're like, no, nah, I don't want yeah. to have Damn. Yeah. But it's delicious, isn't it? Yeah, it is. This is great. And you could tell the care, like, so that's why, you know, you have that, that pit mm -hmm. and you're only using the center. So you still get the smoke factor from it, but you don't, it's not overwhelming. And then when they do the cuts, we do copper pod distillation. We do it twice. You know, they take that cut and it really, there's, you know, those, those senses that the mescalero is going in and he starts checking, you know, every minute, every two minutes as it gets into where you get to the heart. And they're making sure that they're cutting it at the sweetest spot and then redistilling. So we don't redistill our heads and tails. We repurpose those and then go to fertilizer and fire mm -hmm. starters and all kinds of stuff. But so we don't do that. Um, and that's how they, they balanced out the flavor profile without having so much smoke on it. Yeah. So we like to think of ourselves as kind of that gateway to Moscow. 
you yeah. know, you turn over a lot of tequila fans onto this. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. It's, it's very well like balanced, you know? Wow. I'm glad you like it. Mm -hmm. And then, so this one is of uh, Reposado, you said? So what we do was, is we take our Hoven and we put it into barrels and we let it rest for three months. Yeah. And in the beginning we were doing French oak and American, uh, second, both second use. Now it's a little bit more on the French oak side, but there's still a little bit of American um, second use bourbon barrels in there just to kind of give it a little bit of a bite mm -hmm. to it because you want to have um, a little bit of grit in it, but it changes it dramatically. So this one's won the most awards. I think we're up to seven awards on this one. We just brought in two more. Nice. Yeah. Uh, very excited on that one. Um, and then Hoven's at five awards now. And we're waiting on a few other ones to come in. But Reposado, people first look at it because they're like the bottle. Yeah, it's sexy, yeah. right? That was the first thing that got me. And I'm like, okay, black and gold. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> but once you get into the juice, you really get to see mm -hmm. just how special it is. I hope you like chocolate because there's another mm -hmm. one coming. Okay, great. I still have some of this one left on it. I think it's too early for me. Yeah, I, I can grab another glass for you. <laughs> no, no, you know what? Don't even worry about it. Forget. <laughs> and now, so this is caramel. We're so this is a caramel. Them. So, and that helps really bring out, you know, because as soon as you put something into wood, especially French oak, mm. the density of it, but it gives this kind of beautiful, natural vanilla caramel. Like I call it schnickerdoodle. Okay. Right. It's like the mixed bag of every spice that you think that's like warm and cozy that mm -hmm. reminds you just of wood, yeah. you know, chocolate. And then you also have, you can pair it with the orange because you still do have all those high, the flowers and high citrus in it. But I can't decide. So I'm gonna keep going on this. No, I'm just curious. <laughs> I'm watching your face. <laughs> I feel like it's pretty mellow, but the the finish is very like that's where I get more of the I guess kind of the little bit of spice and flavors. And it's like pretty long too. Yeah. Yeah, this one I have in my refrigerator at home. Because I like it's just a little cool. Mm -hmm. It's amazing sipper. This one definitely for sipper, but this one also we've done extremely well with like the Oaxacan old fashions. Oh. Even this mixed with in um, like the Cove, they're doing it with the mes uh, uh, Mespresso, okay. we call it. So the, the Espresso Martini, it really is just, it shines with it. Yeah, I see that. I see how it's definitely amplified when you with the kind of pair it with this, yeah. It just really shows like a different aspect of it, Yeah, you know? Um, I've, you know, I've, I've tried different things to do with, you know, it goes amazing, obviously, with dessert. But mm -hmm. more importantly, I mean, doing these with food, you know, like a really good steak. Yeah. Reposado with the steak. It's amazing. You know, instead of having a glass of wine, you just take a flute of Reposado and sit, eat it. You know, a big pork chop or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now I got to try all that. I, I have like, I'm so far from any idea of like pairing spirits with food, but... That sounds good. You know, yeah. a lot of times it just comes down to when you're drinking something, like, what would I want to eat with this? Right. And you pair it yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, some people are like, wow, I would love this with my mac and cheese. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this would be great. I mean, who knows? People are drink are doing the orange juice with the frosted flakes or something like that. So we'll... <laughs> oh, is that a thing? Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> Thick cock. Man, and are these the... The only two expressions, or are there more variants or anything different So this is along? it. We do have a Nieho. It is resting still. So I'm waiting for that release probably, I'm assuming it's probably a year, another year out. Um, but I'm excited for that one. I'm excited to see what color they decide on the bottle. I have mm. what I want, what I'd love to see, um, just to make it a beautiful set. But that will be, I mean, Mexico, they've been crushing it. We're the number one luxury mezcal in Mexico. Wow. So it's just a matter of building that business here mm -hmm. and then seeing what's, you know, obviously I'll have it. I just don't know when. I'm sure Mexico, because they have this such a huge market for it. I mean, we're crushing it in Monterey and Mexico City, mm -hmm. you know, Guadalajara, Oaxaca and stuff. So it's just a matter of like, okay, you know, I need yeah. to build it a little bit more before we start bringing it more stuff in. But as soon as it's ready, I'll is, have a little bit. Is it um, pretty easy to find here at this point? Like we're in Los Angeles, by the way, anyone listening? Um, 
Like, it, is it at big stores like Total Wine, Bevmo kind of spots? Or no, do you we're have not to there yet. More? Okay. We're not there yet. Our production's not that large. Mm. So, but we will be there eventually. But for right now, we're um, partnered with Reserve Bar. Dot com, so you can yeah, just go in yeah. Reserve Bar and you can order a bottle. But we are in Los Angeles. We're on every single mission. Uh, we're at uh, Lincoln Fine Wine in Venice. We're going into Wally's. And then we'll be in Jade Market. And then what else? And then we've got Emilio's Beverage Warehouse, which you can order on their website. SoCal in Orange County. Damn right yeah. 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 So it's growing, Shirley. So, and also, if you want a cocktail, you can go to Brera. Or you can go to the Co. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, cool. Or cocktail a fl- uh, bar, Flora yeah. Solera. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Um, definitely got to plug the Cove. That's like my favorite drinking spot. Uh, Greg, we actually did an episode together. So if you're interested in hearing more about that, you can listen to that podcast episode. Like just stellar whiskey bar if you find yourself in West Covina and they've got Mescal 33. Yes. And they're like really good about making up like awesome cocktails over there and everything. Those guys so, are stellar. They yeah. helped me. You know, they did, um, we did an event for LA Magazine mm-hmm. in November. It was our, my first, it was like the grand start staple inaugurational event for Mescal 33. And it was for the LA Food Fest in Simi Valley mm-hmm. at Hummingbird. And Greg and Marcus and those guys from the Cove and Matt helped too. They, we collaborated on the cocktail menu and then they helped me execute it at the event. Nice, oh, yeah. So, I mean, first off, they're dear to me anyway, but like I have so much love for them. Mm-hmm. You know, they've been such a great supporter of us, but yeah. You have to check out the Cove guys. Yeah. Great spot. Great people. It it is, it's a hidden gem. (laughs) I mean, I don't know if it's it's so hidden now, but it's not hidden so much anymore, but I mean, I was just in there. Their wall is huge. It's it's awesome. You need to go in. You have to go back in. I'll buy, go meet me there. I'll buy you a drink. All right. I'll buy (laughs) you one of those, uh, my espressos. (laughs) Yeah. It's been too long since I've been there. Yes. Have you been there since the remodel? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you know how epic it is. I I was very surprised when I walked in like post pandemic and I was like, oh shit, this is like a whole new. That the whole time. Like so amazing. Oh, you do. Um, Um, Well, I should have started with this. So my apologies to you and everyone listening, but can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sorry. I just, I was like super stoked to try this. I was like, all right, let's go. Um, But yeah, I mean, like I mentioned, you know, I met you at a, at a high West tasting event at bar Jackalope. Another oh, favorite, yeah, like a while ago. Yeah, Whiskey Society. Uh, that was um, my bucket list thing to do. You know? Really? <laughs> it was. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm just curious, like, how did you get started in all this and like with the becoming ambassadors and getting the Scout 33 going and like, like what's kind of the the beginnings of all that and how you got into this world? So I'm, I lived in Washington, D.C. for 20 years, almost 20 years. And while I was there, I worked for an internet company. And for that internet company, I, God, I was with them forever. It was a store called Blue Mercury. Mm-hmm. They've now since sold and now they're throughout the whole United States, but tiny little store in Georgetown, but super high end. And I just, I was a sales associate. I started with just packaging boxes for Vogue magazine. Hmm. His candles, really expensive tea candles. I boxed them all up. They were getting shipped off to Vogue. Owner comes downstairs and she's like, hey, did she take the price tags off those? I was only there for the <laughs> discount. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, DC was so expensive to so start bartending. Yeah. And then I was bartending at some of the biggest busiest clubs within the city for 20 years. So I really got my niche on to the bar world, spirits. I had a background in education because I was training so many people and then I was you know, helping clients out. And it was like 250,000 products. And it was, yeah. I did that for almost 20 years. Wow. So finally a friend of mine who worked for Constellation, she's like, hey, how about one job? Because I had three, mm-hmm. you know? I was like, wait, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and it happened to be working with Casa Noble um, and back, this was before uh, High West came on board with them. And that's where I really cut my teeth within getting into like this side of the business. And when I had a child, I moved out here. And then I started working for Young's Market Company, mm-hmm. Craft and Luxury uh, Portfolio Manager. And that's where I really, you know, you just dove into that catalog was just incredible. Yeah, You know, I got to work with some of the most amazing small brands, major, amazing distillers. And that's where I really kind of fell in love with the idea of like the science behind spirits and mm-hmm. how they work and how they do, you know, just even the agave awareness on yeah. that sense. Um, there was a, a guy that I used to work with and he used to work with Back Bar Project and he really was the one, I'd sit and listen to him. One tasting would last two hours. You know, he had El wow. Corio and he's sitting there and he's talking about the agave crisis and what's going on and how you have to be really, you know, understanding and you have to understand the transparency behind agave brands. Mm-hmm. So, 
heightened my awareness. I started reading a lot and talking to a lot of my friends that worked with agaves. Um, and then pandemic hit. And we all, they got rid of the whole craft family. So I didn't know what I was gonna do. And a friend of mine from Constellation, she's like, what are you doing these days? And I'm like, what should I be doing these <laughs> <Yeah>. days? So <laughs> went to them and then I ended up working with uh, Constellation again coming out of the pandemic and into it. And that's when I got to work with High West and mm -hmm. Real McCoy and Copper and Kings and Nelson's. Um, shout out to the Nelson's mm -hmm. brothers. They're just amazing. Um, and uh, yeah, they found me. They're like, you seem like you might know a little bit about this. And we just started talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we started talking and we talked for a few months and I was just so happy doing the job that I was doing. You know, like I got to do my bucket list, yeah. which was to host a whiskey society at Bar Jackalope in downtown LA. I mean, mm -hmm. that doesn't get much better. Uh, but yeah, I took the jump. Yeah. And then I, I quit that job. I left that job on, what, February 28th? And I started on March 1st. And then on March 2nd, I was in Oaxaca. Hell you know, yeah. I was there. Yeah. <laughs> and then I really, and then I was just, you know, of course you're nervous. You're like, what have I got myself into? And then getting there and then going and seeing the Palenques and meeting the Master Mescalero and getting to know the founder, Raul, mm -hmm. who's such an incredible human. Um, you ever want to be inspired by somebody when you feel like you're going to jump off that balcony? Mm -hmm. Talk to him. Okay. He walks you right back. He's like, yeah. oh, see, sit down. It's okay. It's fine. You're going to be fine. Um, yeah. And that's how I got started with these guys. And it's been a roller coaster of an adventure trying to launch a Mezcal brand in Southern California mm -hmm. in the high, most highly competitive market. Yeah. You know, it's especially looking the way that we do, you know, people are like, they're very curious. If I could raise an eyebrow, I would. Right. So yeah, but that's, that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, right on. That, that's a hell of a, hell of a ride of different <laughs> <laughs> like kind of gigs and Yeah. A stuff. lot of experience though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've awesome. learned a lot. I've learned definitely a lot, good and bad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's amazing too, like to get to travel to where this all gets done and get the education and all that yeah. stuff. Like that's pretty, pretty it, cool. It definitely changes your perspective on things when you mm -hmm. can, I'd always heard Oaxaca. Yeah. You know, it's magical. And the first time I went, I didn't know what to expect. And, you know, I never met these people. I just was on Zooms with them. You know, we almost missed our flight from Mexico City to Oaxaca. We're running through the airport. We get on the plane and it looks like Instagram just went bleh, mm -hmm. all over it. And it was so funny because Amaras was having some party down there. And I was like, oh gosh, this is going to be that kind of place. You know, I could just think of it like, you know, influencer, like a haven for them. Right. But once I got there, you just realize that it's, that's just like a tiny little like grain of sand on the beach. Right. It was just epic, you know, and going to our palenques. And I just got back from there in January again. And we just got a new palenque, which is like right outside of downtown, um, like the, the district of Oaxaca, mm -hmm. like the downtown area. So yeah, got to do that. Went to visit the fields again. You know, it was yeah. just an epic, beautiful, beautiful place. Yeah, that's amazing. And is, I mean, at, at this point in kind of the spirits world, is Mescal like kind of the biggest, you may have said this already, but is it like the biggest growing category like currently? Yes. Like now it, it Hand sounds, over fist. yeah, like I guess like the bourbon boom is kind of slowing down maybe and yeah. this is becoming the... I mean, just to mention Greg, mm -hmm. we were just talking and he's like, it's crazy. He's, you know, he does all these private barrels, but he's got more people asking for agave now, mm -hmm. you know, than he has some of the most highly sought after allocated whiskeys in the yeah. world. And they're just sitting on the shelf because people are asking more for agave. So it's just wow. an inch. I mean, that if that doesn't show you, you know, how much is changing. However, the, the thing about it, though, a lot of people don't know what agave <laughs> to drink. Yeah. You know? they still ask for certain things or they still just want the clock. Like they're like, can I get a margarita? Yeah. Which is the number one cocktail in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I personally think it should be Negroni, you know, a mezcal Negroni <laughs> yeah. um, would be amazing. But people, that's what they're drinking and they just don't know what they're really drinking. Right. So, you know, trying to teach people and educate them and not to mention like break out of the box, like try some, you know, older, harder to find wild, wild plant mezcals, yeah. you know, blow your mind. And I, I mean, on that, that kind of note of the different plants, cause I did learn this fairly recently is that, cause yeah, mezcal is kind of tough because there's so much, it's like, if I look at a shelf, it's like, besides the different brands, 
within one brand, there's Pechuga, Espadine, Tobala, the, you know, Chichicot, like all the different, yes. and, and I have to like do a bunch of research. I'm like, okay, there are different types of agave. Yes. Some take like 20 years to mature, which is insane to me. Years. Yeah. And then, you know, Espadine is sick so that you see that a lot. Um, I mean, and I know you mentioned Espadine earlier because it, it matures faster. So you yeah, can between use five it. to seven years. We yeah. we let ours go to the full seven. And we want them as plump as possible. Are you? Or I mean, are, is Mezcal Thirty Three already kind of like working on doing some of the other plants as well? Or is it just like Espadine is just what we're doing? Espadine is what we're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, who knows what's to come? Our mas- um, our master mescalero uh, Atuniel. We'll see what he wants to do. You know, he has a new baby with his wife. Um, so I, I think that right now it's pretty much, you know, let's just stick to the plan mm. of what I'm doing because he's now tackling a small human. Yeah, yeah. So, but we'll see what comes in the future. I mean, I would love, I would love to see something like the limited releases and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my favorites are, you know, I love Dobodons and Tepesates, mm-hmm. but I love like bell peppers and I like, seeing yeah, that, you know, yeah. the earth and terroir of things. So we'll see, you know, but... Uh, for now, we're going to stick with Espadine. Yeah. Yeah. It's the easiest to cultivate. You know, mm-hmm. we take the pups and so on. And then it's, you know, that full seven years. So we planned ahead. Yeah. Yeah. We plan on growing. Yeah. yeah but it's... right now we're just Southern California. That's right. all we can tackle. That's all I can <laughs> handle right now anyway. Yeah. Um, and that's hard enough as it is. So, and then eventually we'll open other states. Nice. Yeah. So I guess, does that make it kind of like a craft brand? It is. Yeah, yeah. We're small. I mean, yeah. it looks, the bottle, I, that's the challenge of it. Cause the mm-hmm. bottle doesn't look. Yeah. Like it's something where, you know, they've written the batch number and stuck it on there, but the yeah. batch number is written, mm-hmm. you know, it's probably walked out now, but it's with pen. Yeah. Um, but we are small, you know, we're not big, you know, we're like the kid that's allergic to seafood, right? He ate a shrimp and blew up, right? He's just yeah. pretending to be big. We're not, but we are driven. Like I was t- saying before, Raul, the founder, he is like, I've never seen someone more driven with so much in like he's just inspiring right he's hence the magic of mascal 33 mm-hmm. right then like the number within itself like that's him he's just such the forever optimist you know you know cracks when he needs a crack but like you know just he really wants to grow this and i believe in what he sees you know yeah because i will say i was apprehensive at first because i'm like oh okay i don't know I don't know. Right. But now it's just, I believe it, right? I've drank mm. the Kool-Aid and now I'm like, I'm all in it. <laughs> yeah. I'm all in the 33, so let's go. <laughs> but it's a beautiful thing and it's a beautiful company. Like we work with all the families, you know, we are, we are as we are artisanal, mm-hmm. we're not ancestral, you know, nobody's out there hand pounding, you know, yeah. any of that, uh, the agave, but we're artisanal. We do everything traditionally, mm. you know, we're organic and we're kosher. We work sustainably. We, you know, use all of our bagasse and all of our heads and tails go somewhere else. We work with, you know, rebuilding the homes that are around the Palenque and work with the families. And then their families work with bottling, which is down the street, you know, yeah. and then it literally goes from the bottling plant straight to, into cases. And then it goes to their stores, you know, in their storage or it comes here. You know, there's nothing, it, nothing else happens to it. And we, we're really proud that we finally were certified to be kosher mm-hmm. because in the agave world, that's probably one of the most important things. Okay. You know, do you know what that is? When you're kosher in the agave world? No. It's not, bl- it's not the blessing of it, but okay. what it means is that there's no additives to it. There's oh, no color. Yeah. Right. There's no, you know, any flavoring yeah. or anything of the sort. So being kosher in the agave world is very important. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. But That's we're still growing. <laughs> you know, like we are, we're rebuilding our website right now. Like we have a little, you know, a placeholder right now, but we're rebuilding it. And we're just, you know, it takes time, mm-hmm. you know, I'm up for the challenge most days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I have my scholars, so it's fine. Yeah. So, you know, you talked about how someone who's maybe transitioning from tequila into mezcal wants to try something new. Your um, Hoven here is a good one, which I definitely agree with. That's like a great, if you haven't had it, yeah. a good way to start. I feel like the first time I had mezcal, it was something like, I don't remember what, but super smoky. And I was like, oh man. But now it's that flavor profile has definitely grown on me. Yes. Um, but so, you know, Mezcal 33 Hoven, perfect kind of introductory. You know, we we're talking about cocktails a little bit. If somebody listening is going to go into a bar and they see your brand or even another Mezcal, and what, what do you think is like a good cocktail to, to get to really enhance and like that my, flavor? I have my favorites. Mm-hmm. I have my absolute favorites. As I mentioned before, Negroni. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
it is fantastic with the Hoven. Mm -hmm. um, you can even do it with the Reposado, but you know, it'd be more like on the Boulevardier style, but um, the Hoven in a Negroni, or like I love, <laughs> I love doing exactly what everyone's been doing, right? Reinventing the classic. So yeah. a Hemingway daiquiri, but with the Hoven is probably my number one absolute favorite thing right now. But in Mexico, the entire time we were there, I mean, we drink copious amounts of bottles, hmm. um, but we were drinking what we call the Frida. So it's the Hoven and a tall glass with ice with whatever sparkling water you like, hmm. you know? And then I would just squeeze lime into it because I never put my fruit in my drink. Squeeze the lime into it. But some people were doing the tahini rim. Okay. You know, which is, that's your thing, you know, yeah. by all means. Um, but just those two alone, just with the sparkling water. And not to mention, I don't know if you, if you know this or not, but mezcal, when it's in this form, mm -hmm. right? It's Hoven. It's actually good for you. Really? So, yeah. So it helps with your heart rate. It helps with your cholesterol. Um, it is like a natural, it's like creates dopamine not to mention, you don't get a hangover. And that's saying a lot. Now the Reposado, she'll hurt you the next day because okay. the sugar is from the barrel, <laughs> yeah. she hurts you. But the Hoven, oh my gosh, we drink so much of it. And just drinking that with sparkling water, the next mm. morning I woke up and I'm like, I should feel a lot worse. You know, my rubber band snapped a long time ago, so I don't have the bounce back I used to. Right. <laughs> but for me, I mean, that was just incredible. And then you could taste it. It's really good. Yeah. But I also have, you know, I've had people over my house and, you know, we've gone to Dumont to go right at the dunes and I'm mixing it with, you know, whatever sodas they have, you know, flavored yeah. sparkling water at home. Nailed it. It's mm. so good. But if you go to a bar, just order your favorite cocktail with it in it. You know, even your margarita, just make yeah. it a, a mescalita. Hmm. you know, mescarita. So, and then of course with the reposado, man, an old fashioned crushes, but those are really common. Yeah. You know, right. you can find the Oaxacan old fashions. You could do the espresso martini, whichever it's back, it's back, back, back. Um, and then other than that, it's, you know, I just drink it neat on the yeah. rocks and I've actually mixed, mixed it 50, 50 with Andrew Reyes Verde. And it ends up tasting kind of like a European whiskey, like a scotch. Huh? It was very interesting. Yeah. The person I was with at the bar, they were like, okay, that's disgusting. And I'm like, this is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but, wow. Yeah. Man, that's some great information. I, I It's bad that I immediately feel like I got to put this Hoven thing to the test and just like go to town on a bottle. But yes, I, I won't. But <laughs> no, you should. Hello, it's spring. <laughs> it's sprung. Just, let's test this no hangover thing. <laughs> <laughs> It's for science. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's for science. It, yeah. Hey, I want to know the before and after. Yeah. <laughs> I have to do a video beforehand and then I want a video afterward. Yep. Before, during, after. Let's yeah. see what happens. Be like, all right, James, <laughs> we're going to try this out and then I'll put the testimonial. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be my infomercial. Oh, yeah. Damn. Well, that's great. I mean, um, I definitely need to, to grab these now and get some of these cocktails at the Cove. Um, thanks so much for sharing. I love the idea of like the pairing too. Like that's something I never really think of. Oh, yeah. so then that's cool. Anyone who's watching this can do the same thing and get, get yourself some. Oh, orange I highly recommend chocolate. Yeah, yeah. I highly recommend it, you know, or in, if you really want to go wild, mm -hmm. if you have like a butter praline ice cream, you take your butter praline ice cream or, you know, like a Rocky road or something like that and pour the reposado over it and affogato <laughs> it. Oh Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you can do a 50, like one of my favorite things to do is, you know, do like, you know, 50 fifties, my favorite thing, right? Like mm -hmm. I love Amaro's too. Like I drink vermouth at home. That's like my thing, <sighs> but, or Amaro and do a 50, 50 of the Reposado with your favorite Amaro and pour it over your favorite ice cream or gelato. That's trouble. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here for it. I'm yeah. going to start a cookbook. <laughs> yeah, you should. How you're, did you drunk with nobody knowing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're hitting us with all the great <laughs> recipes and tasters. Damn. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think I think that's that. James, thanks for um, coming out and sharing this and I talking about it. it. It's great. It's been a long time in the making. So Yeah, um, yeah. And keep cool a lookout. We've got ads coming out. We're doing all the tequila events for LA Magazine and Orange Coast. and Yeah. You know, we have uh, we have some big stuff on the plan on coming up, which is going to be really exciting. Yeah. So you'll start seeing more and more of us. There was like a big event at the Rose Bowl or something, right? Recently, I was right? there. Yeah. Yep. The that. Masters of Taste. Okay. 
I got to find out about these crazy events, but I'll send you a calendar. All right. Awesome. See so you have them all. <laughs> well, yeah. Thanks again, James. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, that's a wrap. Yeah. Cheers. All right. Cheer- oh, done, wait. But, sorry. <laughs> Hold on a minute. We can't have that. This one's almost. That would just oh. be bad luck. <laughs> Thank you. Salute. Here's to Mescal 33. Oh, yeah, well, that gets better and better. (laughs) Thank you for listening to the Drinks in a Movie podcast. You can now find us on Instagram at Drinks in a Movie pod, where we'll be posting photos from all the various films that we discuss. You can also email us at drinksinamoviepod at gmail.com. Please rate, review, and subscribe, and thank you for listening.